Okay, so I'm going to now share my screen. Hello, I'm Dr. Harold Koenig, and I'm going to talk to you on the topic of spirituality, religion, and healthcare, research and clinical applications. I'm hoping that you can use this information um, as you develop uh, in your healthcare professional careers. First of all, I'll talk about the role of religion in coping and then talk about, review some of the research on the topic of religion and health. Then describe a theoretical model that might help to explain how it is that religious involvement influences health. Talk about some clinical applications and then come up with conclusions and some further resources. I'll try to speak slowly and clearly so everyone can understand. First of all, religion is a very commonly used coping behavior. I know we're coping here in the US now with the recent diagnosis of our president with the coronavirus. And I know that many of you also, you know, have had uh, challenges in your country uh, with regard to this infection. So, um, you know, these things happen and, and you have to cope with it. Many people, though, turn to religion for comfort during stressful times. Uh, it's used to deal with uncertainty, fear, loss of control, discouragement, and loss of hope. So it's a very, very common way of dealing with the emotional distress, fear, anxiety um, that people go through just because life is hard. Life is hard. Does it help? Does religious coping make a difference in terms of a person's emotional and mental state? So, uh, there has been research that has objectively examined relationships between religious beliefs, practices, commitments, and a person's mental and physical health. First of all, I'll talk a little bit about the relationship with mental health, reviewing some of that research. Now, this is based on a systematic review of research conducted uh, between 1887 when the first paper was published on the effects of intercessory prayer on the health of the royalty in Europe um, all the way up to 2018. Um, the uh, latest review of the research will be coming out in 2022 or 2021 um, with the third edition of the Handbook of Religion and Health. Now, um, the uh, research on mental health, however, has been summarized more recently in, uh, in a book that I recently completed uh, by Academic Press. But I'm going to review a lot of this right here for you now. Uh, the most common emotional condition in the world is depression. So, and it it's very common among people with health problems, medical problems. Religious involvement is related to lower rates of depression and faster recovery from depression, probably because religion helps people to cope, to make meaning of, to make sense of uh, whatever it is that they are dealing with. So depression is less common. It doesn't mean that the that religious, deeply religious people don't experience depression, because they do. And if you look at throughout the, the various uh, religious traditions, you find that many of the leaders 
of the religious tradition struggled with, uh, with depression. That's even true for uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa went through periods of depression where she, she had doubts about her faith. Of course, that's understandable when, when she, as she was exposed to all of this horrific suffering that, that, that she cared for so many people suffering terribly in India and other places around the world. Even the prophet Muhammad is, is uh, reported to have gone through a period of depression after you know, his, his wife died and, and he, you know, he was kind of orphaned. Um, I mean, prior to getting married, he was orphaned as a young, young boy. So he went through a lot of hard times and he was persecuted there in Mecca as he was uh, trying to you know, uh, spread the monotheism uh, in a in a poly polytheistic world there in in uh, Arabia at the time, so depression is very common among those who are deeply religious, um, but it tends overall to be less common, and those individuals who become depressed seem to recover more quickly because of the power that religious faith has in terms of coping with difficult circumstances. Here's an, a study that was published in probably the top psychiatry journal in the world. It's, it's probably the, well, it's the main biological psychiatry journal uh, of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It used to be called the Archives of General Psychiatry. But in this journal, researchers from Columbia, New York, um, Columbia University in New York, uh, examined the structure of the brain um, among those who were religious and those who were not religious. Now this study was done in people who were at high risk for depression because their parents had a major depression. So these are all high risk individuals whom these researchers had found that previously the, those at high risk for depression have changes in their brain that make them more vulnerable to develop depression. And parts of the brain are actually smaller. They have actually shrunk in size. Um, and, and so what they wanted, these researchers wanted to see whether religion or spirituality made a difference in terms of the degree of brain shrinkage among those at high risk for depression. Here, is a, uh, here are the findings. On the left-hand side, these are the brains of individuals for whom religion is not very important. And on the right-hand side, the, the brains are of those for whom religion is very important. You can see that the red areas uh, are areas of significantly reduced cortical thickness. So the cerebral cortex is, you know, is the surface area of the brain that makes us uniquely human. And uh, you can see that, that individuals who don't have much religious or spiritual beliefs, they have more areas of red there, more areas of cortical shrinkage that are significantly uh, you know, shrunk compared to those on the other side, uh, the other panel, for whom religion is very important. Now, this does not mean that religion causes an expansion of these shrunken areas of the brain among those at high risk for depression um, because, because of the study design. It doesn't indicate that these are causal effects of religiosity. However, they are consistent with that notion. They are consistent, it's not proof, but they're consistent with the notion that perhaps religious involvement in some ways can actually change the structure of the brain. Now, this research is consistent with research on suicide, which indicates that individuals who are more religious are a lot less likely to, to commit suicide. 
this is true for 75% of quantitative studies that have looked at this relationship. So religious beliefs um, help people not to experience the depression, the hopelessness, the meaninglessness that drives individuals to end their lives. Also, religious beliefs, there are, are the beliefs themselves are discouraging of people committing suicide. In the Catholic Church, for many years, if you committed suicide, uh, that was a mortal sin, which meant that, that you know, you were basically, you were going to hell and you would be separated from your loved ones for all of eternity. So that was enough to keep Catholics from, you know, committing suicide. Now the church has changed that view in the past, uh, I think 20 or 30 years, such that uh, the church now recognizes that people who commit suicide are suffering from a mental illness. And that is what's driving them to end their lives. And so uh, the view of suicide being a mortal sin is, is no longer uh, part of the main Catholic doctrine. So it's, it's just, you know, you have compassion on people who have a mental illness who end their lives, and, and that's the way the church is, has, now views it. Here's a large study of 90,000 women in the United States. These are all nurses, and uh, these, uh, these are all women and nurses, all in the United States, 90,000, who were followed for about 15 years. And what they examined was the likelihood of committing suicide. So this was actually suicide incidents. Um, and what they found, now, now this is research from the Harvard School of Public Health. So uh, it, it's a very highly credible group of researchers and it's published again in JAMA Psychiatry, the top psychiatry journal in the world. And what you find here is that individuals who attended religious services at least once a week were five times, five times less likely to commit suicide during that 15 year follow-up. Now the same relationship is true for alcohol use, abuse, and dependence. So re religious involvement is related in, in 80 to 90% of studies, those who are more religious don't use alcohol as much, don't abuse alcohol, and don't become dependent on it uh, as much as those without religious beliefs. So this is a very, very uh, powerful findings, one of the most strongest findings um, in the research. And what's particularly important about this area of research is that most of these studies were done in young people, were done in high school or college students or young, you know, young people who have their entire lives to live ahead of them. So religion seems to counteract the development of addictions and of, of abuse, these patterns of substance abuse that will then affect the person for the rest of their life, affect their education, affect their, their, their job, their future job and, and their health. Uh, the same is true for illicit drug use. Again, religious people just don't get involved in those kinds of behaviors as much as those who are less religious. Not only is religious involvement related to uh, negative uh, emotional or mental states, not only is it related to less depression, less suicide, less substance abuse, but it's also related to positive emotions, well-being, happiness, life satisfaction. And in fact, the relationship is even stronger among positive emotions than among negative emotions. So close to 90% of studies based on this systematic review find that religious people are, are happier, are more satisfied with their lives. They experience more positive emotions. And uh, of those 326 studies, quantitative studies, um, only three studies, less than 1%, 
found that religious people were, were not as happy as those who were uh, less religious. Now, religion also gives people a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Meaning and purpose is very important in terms of, uh, of motivation for, for uh, you know, caring for yourself, especially when you're sick. You know, in order to recover, it takes a lot of effort to get better, to recover, to rehabilitate after a stroke or a heart attack or an accident or a surgical procedure. And individuals who have more meaning, purpose, hope, and optimism are going to recover more quickly because they have a reason to get better. You know, people who have lost the reason to get better are not going to work as hard to recover. Social support is also much more common among those who are more religious. More than 80% of these studies show that not only is there more social support um, among those who are more religious, but it's a higher quality of support. Uh, the kind of support that lasts um, even when the individual cannot return the support. One reason for that is because religious beliefs command us to love our neighbor, to, to care for one another. That's part of the religious belief system of, of all of the major religious traditions, to support one another, whether, you know, whether it's easy to do that or not. Religion also influences um, rates of delinquency and crime. So, um, you know, over 100 studies have examined this. Again, over 80% show that people who are more religious, young people just don't commit delinquent acts as often. They don't get in trouble as much if they're more involved in a religious community and they're exposed to a more pro-social peer group. Um, and, and not only does religious involvement reduce the likelihood of delinquency and then later adult crime, but it's also related to better academic performance in terms of school. So religious people, religious students are more likely to complete their education. They're more likely to get high grades. They're more likely to, to go to college. And then ultimately in the, work, in the workplace, they, they, they tend to do better because they're more responsible, they care more for other co-workers, and they're, they're more satisfied with their work. So all of this, this is all based on systematic quantitative research that's been published over the past 20 years. Now, how do we understand how religious involvement influences um, mental health, because we're talking about mental health right now. Religious involvement actually influences mental health across the lifespan, beginning even before a person is born, amazingly enough, because the religiousness of their parents influence, influence the development of their brain as they are maturing in the, in the, in the mother's womb. An example is that um, if, if the father is involved in alcohol and drug abuse, um, you know, or is stressed or depressed or not, not doing well emotionally, um, or is taking in substances, actually the sperm itself is, is changed so that when it combines with the ovum in the woman, um, it is passing on traits that are going to make the, the baby more vulnerable once it's born to stress and to, to health problems. And, and of course, you know, if the mother is using drugs or alcohol, is involved in a highly stressful situation, maybe a divorce or having problems with, 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 her, uh, with, with her spouse or boyfriend or whatever, that's going to cause changes in the woman's body that will adversely affect the brain of the growing infant, of the, of the growing fetus. And when, when the, the child ultimately is born, they're, they're born with, with, uh, 
with vulnerabilities to stress later in life as well as early in life. Then of course, um, religious families tend to want children more. And uh, now that's just a general tendency, but, but, but you know, the religious beliefs themselves encourage having children and emphasize the value of children. So when the child is born, the child is more likely to be wanted and therefore is more likely to develop a sense of trust in, in a basic sense of trust, which is vital for mental health throughout that person's life. Now, as they get older, of course, you know, the religious beliefs are going to affect their behaviors. Their uh, young people, adolescents, are going to be less likely to use drugs, use alcohol, have sex outside of marriage, have teen pregnancy, all of those activities are going to interfere with their education and their ability to later obtain a good job and afford health insurance and live in a safe neighborhood. As, as people grow older and go into adulthood, then they're having to deal with, um, with problems at work, with economic problems, and, and religion helps people to cope with those, with those problems that adults face. And then of course, as people get older and start developing health problems, then religion really seems to make a difference because again, it's a powerful coping behavior and it gives meaning to, to difficult circumstances, including suffering that people go through when they get sick and ill and become dependent on others and go through difficult health circumstances. And then, uh, you know, as people, start to approach death, then um, religious beliefs give, give meaning and give them hope that there is something beyond this life. And so that, that hope is very important in terms of maintaining a positive attitude as, as people get closer to death and, and they, they can cope better with that if, if they believe that there is a life afterward in which they will not have to suffer anymore, that they will be with God and with their loved ones. It's a, it's a beautiful belief system. And there's no way to tell whether it's true or not. There's no way to tell. There is no way to, to prove that there is an afterlife or anything comes after we die. But we will know that once we die. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, that's uh, it's a safe bet then to have to develop a strong religious faith and to live by that faith. Okay, uh, now these benefits to mental health also apply to physical health and physical vigor and, uh, you know, and, and even survival. Um, part of the effects that religion has on physical health are because of the influence that religion has on health behaviors. So those health behaviors are, include exercise, being physically active. Religious people tend to be more physically active. You can see that in almost 70% of studies that religious people are more, more likely to, to, to be involved in physical activities and exercise. They're less likely to be involved in extramarital sexual activities. They're more likely to practice safer sexual practices and uh, they're less likely to develop venereal diseases from, from sexual activities with multiple partners. Now there is one health behavior that religious people tend to be not as good on, and that is weight. So religious people tend to be heavier. They tend to eat more, although they do tend to eat a better diet. So religious people are eating a better diet but they're just eating too much of it. It's, it's the one sin that people can, that religion allows people to do, and in fact encourages them to do, and that is to eat. But again, it's important to maintain your weight because uh, being overweight or obese is going to affect many areas of your health and your quality of life. Cigarette smoking. Again, religious people just don't smoke as many cigarettes. And in 90% of studies, 122 of 135 studies, and again, especially among the young, 
So this is going to affect their health for the rest of their life. It's going to, going to uh, the religious person, if they don't smoke, are going to be less likely to have lung cancer, less likely to develop chronic lung disease, less likely to develop hypertension, less likely to develop uh, heart attacks and stroke and, and even develop um, brain disorders as they get older, such as dementia. So by not smoking cigarettes alone, this has enormous effects on health. So now let's just look at physical health. Um, so religious involvement is related to better immune functions in the vast majority of studies. Now this is important, especially now with this coronavirus, because the only thing that stands between that virus and us is our immune system. So having a stronger immune system is going to enhance resilience to this virus, and even if somebody becomes infected with the virus, they're going to recover quicker because they have a stronger immune system if they are more religiously involved. The same applies to endocrine functions. In other words, stress hormone levels such as cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, are, are, have been found to be lower among those who are more spiritual or religious. And there have been a number of randomized controlled trials showing that, that forms of prayer and meditation can actually lower levels of these stress hormones. Stress hormones, of course, adversely affect immune function, which is part of the mechanism by which, uh, you know, because religious involvement helps people to cope better, lowers their anxiety and stress, it lowers these, these stress hormones and therefore, because stress hormones are lower, immune function then is better. So we actually did the first study uh, published in the world uh, looking at the effects of church attendance on levels of IL-6. IL-6 is a inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokine, which basically what that means is that it's, it's an indicator of immune functioning. And those individuals who attended religious services more often had stronger immune systems. This study was actually replicated, replicated soon afterwards by another research group, uh, and they found the same thing. Cardiovascular functions tend to be better. Uh, lower blood pressure, um, less coronary artery disease among those who are more religiously involved. So again, this makes sense because we know that people who have depression and who are anxious and worrying all the time and stressed out, they have worse health outcomes. They have more likely to develop high blood pressure, more likely to develop heart attacks. And so this makes all perfect physiological sense of why religious people ought to be healthier from a cardiovascular standpoint. Here is a study that we did here in North Carolina showing that uh, blood pressure is significantly lower among those who are both attending religious services more often and who are reading the Bible more often, who are studying the Bible and praying. So those who, who do both, both the public religious activity, attending services, and who engage in private religious activities if they do both of those together, that seems to be related to lower blood pressure. And many others have also replicated that. This is a study of, of, of Jews in Israel. Uh, this was 10,000 men in middle age who were followed for almost 25 years. Among those Jewish people who both were participating in their synagogue and who were praying and doing the Jewish rituals in the home, were significantly less likely to die of a heart attack. They were 20% less likely to die of a heart attack, even after taking into account blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, smoking, weight, and baseline heart disease. So despite controlling for those, those other factors, still 
those who are more religious uh, were less likely to die of a heart attack. Here is uh, recovery after open heart surgery. This was done at Dartmouth Medical Center in New Hampshire. They found that the, the likelihood of dying after open heart surgery uh, during the first six months after open heart surgery was 14 times, 14 times lower among those who both had high social support and who were using their religion to cope. That combination of using religion to cope and having high social support, oftentimes that support was from their religious community, that this was a powerful factor in predicting survival after having an open heart surgery. And in fact, research has shown that mortality overall is lower in terms of during mortality during a certain follow-up period is lower among those who are more religious. So survival, religious people live longer based on now over 100 studies. And in fact, the Harvard School of Public Health recently, uh, within the past five years, published a major paper uh, looking at survival among 75,000 women in the nurses' health study. And what they found was that women who attended religious services at least once a week were one third less likely to die, one third, 33% reduction in mortality, all cause mortality, during a 15 year follow up. And this was also, this was true for cardiovascular mortality as well as for cancer mortality. So those who are more actively involved in their religious community um, were were less likely to die of heart disease and less likely to die of cancer compared to those who were not attend, not involved in any religious activities. Now this, they tried to explain why is it that religious people are living longer? Part of it has to do with that they are not depressed as much because they cope better. They don't smoke as much. They're more optimistic. They, more, they have more, more broader social networks. They're more socially integrated. So those were the main factors predicting, uh, uh, explaining the effects on mortality. Now here is a slide that describes kind of all of the research uh, in the area, all of the quantitative research, which is based on numbers. This is not just people's you know, stories or whatever. This is based on numbers. Um, this is a summary of all of that research. So here is, uh, you can see that uh, there, on this axis, you, this is the number of studies. So 2,500 studies, 2,000. And here are the findings down here. Um, so a few studies report complex results, which means it's hard to figure out you know, what, they, what they found based on studying the paper. Um, nearly 250 studies find that religious people have worse health than those who are less religious. Worse health, and it's significantly worse. Also, a few studies show a trend, a statistical trend in that direction. A number of studies uh, report mixed results depending on which aspect of religiosity they're measuring, um, there may be certain aspects that are positively related to health and other aspects that are negatively related. There are also, a, uh, you know, a couple of hundred, several hundred studies showing that religious people tend to be healthier, tend to be from a statistical trend uh, standpoint. Now, these are the number of studies that show that religious people are significantly healthier than those who are less religious. So it's, it's approaching 2,500 quantitative studies. And then a number of studies find no association between the two. So this is kind of a summary of all of the research out there published prior to the year 2012. Now, this is how we try to understand 
these relationships. Um, the, the source of the health benefits, we believe, this is again, this is a theoretical model, has to do with belief in and attachment to God. So this applies to Western monotheistic traditions such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So belief in attachment to God is nourished in a faith community, and it's expressed in terms of what are called the theological virtues. Faith in God, hope in God, and love of God. So all of those then result in public religious practices, private religious practices, such as prayer and scripture study, various forms of religious commitment, religious devotion, religious experiences, and religious coping. All of this affects decisions that people's, people make, lifestyle choices, and decisions about health behaviors. Also, um, this tends to enhance religious involvement enhances or seeks to enhance the psychological traits or virtues. We call them virtues, human virtues. They include forgiveness, honesty, courage, self-discipline, altruism, loving your neighbor, humility, gratitude, be grateful for what one has, patience, and dependability. All of those factors then influence the experience of positive emotions, social relationships, and help to neutralize negative emotions. These in turn affect immune endocrine and cardiovascular functions, which then in turn affect physical health and longevity. So this is a this is kind of a model of how it all works. And then of course all of this is influenced by genetic by hereditary influences, as well as developmental experiences as people are growing up, you know, as, as children, and also based on temperament. Okay, so now applications. So in the next five <laughs> minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about applications. So health professionals should take a spiritual history. So that's really the biggest one. Uh, talk with patients about these issues. Respect, value, support, the beliefs and practices of the patient. Regardless of their religious beliefs, you're, you are to support their beliefs. Um, and if a person has no religious beliefs, that's okay too. You don't then continue to persist on it. You let it go. Um, identify the spiritual needs of patients. Ensure that someone meets the patient's spiritual needs. You know, have them see a clergy person because, uh, you know, who is trained to address the spiritual needs. And if a patient asks, if the patient asks you to pray with them, go ahead. Go ahead and pray with the patient if you feel comfortable doing that. Because, you know, we're really, we're not about curing all the time. We're more about, health, we as health professionals are more about caring. So, you know, when you, when you pray with a patient, it's more an expression of your care for them. And that means a lot to the patient. And also work with the, the patient's faith community after getting the patient's consent to help meet any spiritual needs after they're, you know, after they leave the clinic or are discharged from the hospital. So here's an example of a spiritual history. Do your beliefs provide comfort? Do your religious or spiritual beliefs provide comfort? You have to specify religious or spiritual beliefs. Are your religious or spiritual beliefs a source of stress? They can sometimes be a source of stress. Do you have um, beliefs that might influence your medical decisions? A lot of times people's religious beliefs influence their medical decisions. So we we have to know about what those beliefs are. Are you a member of a faith community, such as a church, synagogue, or mosque? 
And if yes, is that faith community supportive to you? Is it supportive? Do you have any other spiritual concerns that you would like someone to address? So this was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, back almost 20 years ago now. What else can you do besides taking the spiritual history? Again, support the religious or spiritual beliefs of the patient, both verbally and non-verbally. So it's really about the patient's beliefs, not so much about your beliefs. It's about the patient's beliefs, and you're going to want to be supporting that patient's beliefs, religious or spiritual beliefs. Today in medicine, this is, this is called patient-centered care. That is the standard of care now. Ensure the patient has resources to support their spirituality. And sometimes you may have to accommodate the environment to meet the spiritual needs of patients. Now we actually have five CME videos. Uh, these are very high quality videos that describe how to integrate spirituality into patient care using the spiritual care team approach. Now these videos are on our website. They're all free. You can watch them uh, anytime you want. Um, there's, there are three that are intended for physicians. One is intended for nurses. And then the last one is intended for the team in general, which would include chaplains, nurses, occupational therapists, all different healthcare professionals. So in conclusion, religious involvement is related to better mental, social, and behavioral health and improves these, these aspects of health over time. As religious involvement lessens in the United States, in Europe, in Spain, um, as a result of increasing secularization, what we've seen are increasing crime rates, increasing alcohol and drug use, and increasing addiction. And that all makes sense because religion helps with to enhances internal control. If you don't have internal control of your drives, then you need police, external control. You need jails, you need judicial systems in order to keep people under control so that they don't hurt each other. But religion is meant to, to encourage people to care for one another, <laughs> pro-social kinds of activities, and uh, discourages negative behaviors that are hurting oneself, like drug and alcohol use. Religion is related to better physical health, less functional disability as people grow older, and also less cognitive decline with aging. So actually religion involvement, religious involvement helps you to keep your memory as you get older. These findings have huge implications for public health and for healthcare costs as religion becomes less common with each younger generation. There is again a trend in the US and in Europe that, that suggests that with each younger generation, religion is becoming less common. So as religion becomes less common, we think all sorts of issues related to healthcare costs are gonna be increasing as well as costs for social control. The clinical applications of research on religion, spirituality, and health are vast in terms of provision of mental and physical health care. And that's why you all need to know about this as healthcare, as future healthcare professionals, you need to know about the powerful impact that religious involvement can have on the health of your patients. Again, not all your patients are going to be religious, and that's okay. Um, you know, you treat everybody with compassion and respect, regardless of their religious beliefs. That's okay. But if a person is religious, then support those religious beliefs, because we think that religion is good for your health. Okay, so I'm going to... 